भगवती वासुदेवाय नमो भगवती वासुदेवाय We'll chant together text 16 and there's a whole series before that without purport we'll cover them also o tast vya vya bicharena kanye kanye la nama sabhavat tam vilokya manu praha Nati tushta mana gurum. O tastad yabi charena. Kanye la, kanye la namasa bhavat. Tam vilokya manu praha. Nati tushta mana gurum. O tus tad yabicharena Kanye la namasa bhavat Tam vilokya manu praha Nati tus tamana gurum O tas tad yabicharena Kanye la namasa bhavat Tam vilokya manu praha Nato tishtamana gurum O tas tad yabicharena Kanye la namasa bhavat Tam vilokya manu praha Nati tish tu manama Ladies O tas tad vyabhi charena Kanye la namasa bhavat Tam vilokya manu praha Nati tushtamana gurum O tas tad yabicharena Kanye la namasa bhavat Tam vilokya manu praha Nato tishtamana gurum O tas tad vyabicharena Kanye la namasa bhavat Tambilokya manu praha Nati tishtamana gurum O tuhu Of the priest Tat of the yagya, jabicharena, by that transgression, kanya, a daughter, ila, ila, nama, by the name, sa, that daughter, abhavat, was born. Tam unto her, vilokya, seeing, manoho, mano, praha, said, na, not, ato tishtamana, very much satisfied, gurum, unto his guru. Oh, I'm going to go back. Before I read this translation for 16, and we'll cover the verses prior that have no purport, starting with 9. 
O oh, King Parikshit, from the navel of the Supreme Personality of Godhead was generated a lotus flower, a, lo a golden lotus, excuse me, on which the four-faced Lord Brahma took his birth. Text 10. From the mind of Lord Brahma, Marichi took his birth, and from the semen of Marichi, Kashyapa appeared from the womb of the daughter of Daksha Maharaj. From Kashyapa, by the womb of uh, Ditti, Vivaswan took birth. Texts 11 and 12. O king, best of the Bharata dynasty, from Vivaswan, by the womb of Sangya, Shraddha Deva Manu was born. Shraddha Deva Manu having conquered his senses, begot ten sons in the womb of his wife, Shraddha. The names of these sons were, there's ten, Ikshvaku, Nriga, Sharyati, Dishta, Drishta, Karushaka, Narishyanti, Prish, Prishadra, Prishadra, Nabhaga, and Kavi. So we spoke a little bit yesterday. Ikshvaku, the eldest son of Vivaswan, um, ruled in Ayodhya, built by Vivaswan. Excuse me, built by... Uh, by Vasvatamanu. So here we go. Text 13. Manu at first had no sons, therefore, in order to get a son for him, the great saint Vashishta, who was very powerful in spiritual knowledge, performed a sacrifice to satisfy the demigods Mitra and Varuna. Interesting. We'll come back to Mitra and Varuna shortly. Text 14. During that sacrifice, Shraddha, Manu's wife, who was observing the vow of subsisting only by drinking milk, approached the priest, offering the sacrifice, offered obeisances to him, and begged for a daughter. Text 15. Told by the chief priest, now offer oblations. The person in charge of oblations took clarified butter to offer. He then remembered the request of Manu's wife and performed the sacrifice while chanting the word Vashat. The word for word says Vashat Karam, the mantra beginning with the word Vashat. Vashat is the beginning word of a longer mantra, so he started the mantra with the intention, we discussed this yesterday, the intention that a daughter should be born. So sure enough, text 16, Manu had begun that sacrifice for the sake of getting a son, but because the priest was diverted by the request of Manu's wife, a daughter named Ila was born. And upon seeing the daughter, Manu was not very satisfied. Thus he spoke to his Guru Vashishta as follows. Report. Because Manu had no issue, he was pleased at the birth of the child, even though a daughter, and gave her the name Ila. Later, however, he was not very satisfied to see the daughter instead of a son. Because he had no issue, he was certainly very glad at the birth of Ila, but the pleasure was temporary. Now, I'd like to read the next. Let's see if we get to it, time-wise. The, the next purport is very wonderful. Um, speaks about chanting Hare Krishna and the Sankirtan movement of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, here, this is largely uh, 
Quranic history. We spent a fair amount of time yesterday discussing what's the relevance of all of this. And the relevance of all of this is to see the connection of all things with the source of all things. So on the one hand, there's Big Bang. On the other hand, there's Krishna or Lord Vishnu. And then Lord Vishnu's expansion, Garbhadakshai Vishnu. So the previous canto, just re reminding ourselves, the previous canto we finished the other day, canto eight, ended with King Satyavrata hearing the Vedas directly from Lord Matsya. And then in Satyavrata in his next life became Vaivasvatamanu. So that's where this canto begins, Vaivasvatamanu. Uh, the question at the beginning of Canto 9 is, O oh, great Shukadeva Goswami, please describe more about Vaivasvatamanu and the lineages of kings issuing from Vaivasvatamanu and, you know, the, the, uh, the dynasty of Vivaswan, the Sun dynasty. So that's a big portion of Canto 9. And then the Moon Dynasty, we heard that there was this, this Canto describes the combination of the Sun Dynasty, Moon Dynasty. We discussed that already yesterday in relation to Ila and Ila becoming Sujumna and Sujumna becoming a woman and then becoming half one month woman, one month man and all of that very interesting subject. But as a woman, Sadyumna married Buddha, spelled differently than Lord Buddha, from the Moon Dynasty, and that's how the two combined. We're, ju we're just getting a picture of how everything comes from Krishna. So in the chapter summary, Prabhupada states that in the beginning, uh, a little summary of things that are said in earlier cantos, Canto 2, Canto 3, in detail, Canto 3, is now in a very summary way being presented. So here we go. Garbhadakshay Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead's expansion, second expansion, Garbhadakshay Vishnu, from his navel comes a golden lotus, and atop of the golden lotus comes Lord Brahma. And um, in the third canto, we hear the many things, but after becoming perfectly enlightened, what his duty is and who he is and everything by performing his tapa, he then begins the process of creation. And after creating the universe, he wants to fill it up with living entities. And so sequentially, first is the four Kamaras. They say, no, we don't want to do that. He becomes angry, Lord Shiva appears. And the very next in the sequence of Canto 3 is 10 great sages appear. Now, one of those 10 great sages, that's um, the whole third canto isn't retold. It just says that um, from the mind of Lord Brahma came Marichi. From the mind of Lord Brahma, Marichi took birth. And then from the semen of Marichi, Kashyapa appeared from the womb of the daughter of Daksha Maharaj. So, for those of you that are a little newer and not so familiar with all of this, without the assistance of a wife, Brahma has the capacity, because he's Lord Brahma, to produce living entities. So, the four Kumaras, of course, Lord Shiva just manifests from his brow. And then these 10 personalities, 10 great sages. The, the function of these 10 great sages is to assist Lord Brahma in filling up the universe with good praja. So these, these are 10 men. And then there's actually number 11. So right after Rudra or Lord Shiva appears, comes these 10 for the extensions of generations. I'm reading from Canto 3, Chapter 12. Here's the 10. Marichi is the first. 
listed. Here's the other nine. Atri, Angira, Pulashtya, Pulaha, Kratu, Brighu, Vishishta, we heard Vishishta mentioned being approached by by this Vatamanu to assist him. So um, Vishishta, Daksha, we've heard a lot about Daksha. And then the tenth son is Narada. So Narada is the exception. Narada doesn't become married. Narada is a uh, sannyasi and brahmachari or without female companionship. And he has another function. He's you know the rishi amongst the these other nine. Um, so, so I'll read them again. Marichi, Atri, Angira, Pulashya, Pulaha, Kratu, Brigu, Vishishta, Daksha, and the ten son Narada. We hear, this is Canto 3, chapter 12. We hear further in Canto 6 about, well, we hear Canto 4, Daksha uh, loses his head, literally, and gives up his life because uh, this, this Daksha, I call it Daksha part one, uh, offended Lord Shiva, Lord Shiva his elder brother because Lord Shiva is direct son of Brahma and another ten sons, Daksha being one of them, very proud of his capacity for performing yagyas is Daksha. Without all the detail, it's a long section of the Bhagavatam. Daksha offended Lord Shiva big time and um, he lost his head. His head was chopped by Virabhadra. His head was replaced with a goat's head at the request of the assembly there. So they with, through the mouth of his goat's head, Daksha apologized, begged forgiveness. Lord Shiva gave his forgiveness. So the sin or the reaction to the sin was taken by Lord Shiva's forgiveness. But sin is, tendency for sin may remain even if sin is forgiven. So moving over to the sixth canto, we find out that Daksha died of shame. Imagine walking around with a goat's head and previously he was very beautiful. So he died of shame. And then he came again, Daksha came again, Daksha part two. And he still had the propensity to produce generations, and he had offensive mentality. So Canto 6 describes his 10,000 sons and 1,000 sons, Haryashvas and Savalashvas, and Narada examining them, Narada accepting them as qualified to become brahmachari, Daksha being very disturbed by that twice, Daksha cursing, Daksha cursing Narada for um, acting according to Daksha's perception and conclusion, acting against the codes of a renunciate, he shouldn't do this. So I curse you. You can't stay anywhere, you have to keep traveling. And then following that in Canto 6, Daksha, through the same wife, long description of this very special qualified wife, there were 60 daughters. So there's 10,000 sons, 1,000 sons, and he moved over to daughters. And then those 60 daughters were then distributed to uh, different personalities. Now there's a little Listen carefully. There's a apparent discrepancy because 
in the distribution of Daksha's daughters, it says that 17 of those 60 daughters were given to Kashyapa. Now, in the verse that we just read, it says, Marichi, through the womb of a daughter of Daksha, Kashyapa was born. So I'll read from the, the, the sixth canto, just so we're, we're clear about it. Canto 6, Chapter 6, Text 1. Chukadev Goswami said, My dear King, at the request of Lord Brahma, Prajapati Daksha begot 60 daughters in the womb of his wife, Akshini. All the daughters were very affectionate toward their father. He gave 10 daughters in charity to Yamaraj. Thirteen daughters to Kashyapa. Twenty-seven to the moon god. Two each to Angira, Krishashva, and Bhuta. The four other daughters were given to Kashyapa, thus Kashyapa had seventeen. No mention of daughters of Daksha being given to Marichi. So, what about that? Well, different um, kalpas is the way to understand something like that, at least quite possibly. A different cycle of yugas, different day of Brahma, and so forth. And Shukadev Goswami uh, said at the beginning of this narration that the, the detail is too much to tell. It would take hundreds of years. So I'll only give essences. So, no problem. This description in Canto 6, this description in Canto 9, don't seem to match. But different kalpas, different cycles of the four yugas, or different days of Brahma, etc. No problem. That's how such a message can be discerned. There's, there's several examples. One of those several examples is spoken by Jiva Goswami in relation to two different Lord Varahas, uh, Shweta, White Varaha, and Rakta, or Red Varaha. And they're of different Yuga cycles. And Jiva Goswami says that Shukadeva Goswami merges the two. He doesn't make a distinction, this one, that one. He just blends the two stories. No problem. Or, just we just finished in chap Canto 8, hearing about Matsya. And we heard no elaboration, but there's two Matsyas. Matsya 1 and Matsya 2. And no distinction between Matsya 1 and Matsya 2. At least in that section of the Bhagavatam. Maybe elsewhere, some different description. Likely, elsewhere, there's different description. But different, day, different yuga cycles is the point. I'm bringing this up uh, not to, like, disturb your minds, but to relieve your minds. <laughs> because if you read carefully, sometimes we don't read carefully, but if you read carefully, you, you'll see, wait a minute, it says this in Canto 6 and says that in Canto 9, what's going on? And so what's going on is 
different yoga cycles. And uh, Shukadeva Goswami do doesn't always make a differentiation and say, oh, this is this yoga cycle and that's that yoga cycle. So don't get confused. He doesn't do that. So as a reader, we need to recognize that sometimes what's going on. Prabhupada d d explains that the Lord and his devotees perform activities that are in principle uh, essentially the same because the bhava, the, the mood of love between the devotee and the Lord is essentially the same. But then there's variety. Variety is the mother of enjoyment. Another example of this, because I've been spending some time with um, Ramayana and Prabhupada's comments about Ramayana, there's different Ramayanas. There's Valmiki Ramayana, which depicts things a certain way. And there are other Ramayanas, even in, the, in this ninth canto, at the very, very beginning, Shukadeva Goswami says, I'm only going to refer to those versions of Ramayana that are authentic, meaning even at that time there were versions that weren't. And there was more than one version. And I'll give a little practical example. Uh, in Valmiki Ramayan, there's no mention of when Ramchandra comes with Sita in the um, Vimana of Kuvera, the Pashpaka, Pushpaka Vimana, there's no mention in Valmiki Ramayana of stopping at the place where Lord Ram, having killed a Brahmana, is worshiping Lord Shiva, propitiating Lord Shiva for release of the sin of having killed the Brahmana. Ravana, because he, Ravana was born in a Brahmana family. No mention of that pastime at all in Valmiki Ramayan. Yet, when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did his tour of South India, that's one of the places he went. So Lord Chaitanya was honoring something that's not even mentioned in Valmiki Ramayan, but it's something Lord Chaitanya was honoring. So it, d d there isn't any elaboration why or on what authority, scriptural authority, was Lord Chaitanya doing that? He was doing that. It's just one of Lord Ramachandra's pastimes that he was honoring, although it's not in Valmiki Ramayan. And there's other examples. So, I'm again, I'm mentioning this not to create confusion, but as you become a little more accustomed to studying scripture, and you see, wait a minute, over here it says this, and over there it says that. How do you, don't get spun out. There, there's practical explanations, at least potential practical explanations, one of them being uh, different pastimes of Lord Ramachandra in different yugas, different Treta yugas. And so there are different renderings as one possible, why, why does this one say this and that one says that? Or different matyas or different varahas or different descriptions of how the, the universe unfolds and through the daughters of, in this case, the daughters of Daksha or one of the daughters of Daksha married Marichi and, and Kashyapa was born from that combination. Or in the sick in the sick canto it says something else. Or at least doesn't say that. This of the sixty daughters, no, no, no mention of Marichi being given one of Daksha's daughters for marriage and Kashyapa being born. Okay. How you handle hey, wait a minute. Apparent discrepancy. Okay, so now we're going to go to um, the next verse. Can't go on. From the mind of Brahma, Marichi took birth, and from the semen of Marichi 
Kashyap appeared from the womb of the daughter of Daksha Maharaj. From Kashyapa, by the womb of Aditi, Vivaswan took birth. Now that's described in Canto 6, in that chapter 6 in detail. It goes like this. Of the 60 daughters of Daksha, 13 and then other four, a total of 17 daughters of Daksha were given to Kashyapa. And that there was a purpose. That purpose was to fill the universe with good praja. So one of those 17 daughters of Daksha was Aditi. And then, of course, Ditti and Aditi. There are two of the 17 daughters. And there's, there's others who are wives of Kashyapa. So mentioned here is from Kashyapa by the womb of Aditi, Vivaswan was born. Now, Vivaswan was the eldest of 10 sons. And the, those 10 sons make up, many of them, make up devas or demigods, Kashyapa and Aditi, Aditi being the mother of a number of demigods, Indra being one of them. So here's um, the, the list, the eldest brother, Vivaswan. We'll come back to Canto 9 in a moment. Vivaswan, Aryama, does that name Aryama mean anything to you? Aryama is the one who filled the post of Yamaraj when Yamaraj was cursed. Aryama, one of the sons of Aditi and Kashyapa. Pusha, Tushta, Tushta becomes a really important personality in the sixth canto. One of the sons of um, Kashyapa and Aditi. Tushta. Tushta was a Brahmana. His son was Vishwarup. Vishwarup was the one that was killed by Daksha. Excuse me, Indra. Tushta, Savita, Bhaga, Data, Vidhata, Varuna, Mitra, Shatru, and Urukrama. Now, Mitra and Varuna are mentioned in our ninth canto Bhagavatam. These are the two that Vashishta approached to have a son for um, Manu, yeah. Now, Vashishta is elder. He's elder to all these people. He's one of the direct sons of Lord Brahma. But he performed this, the, the sacrifice propitiating these personalities. And the last is Urukrama. That's Vamana Dev. Vamana appeared as the son of Kashyapa and Aditi. So now we'll go back to the ninth canto. Isn't it nice, like, cross-referencing here? I hope you're not confused yet. From Kashyapa, same sentence, by the womb of Aditi, Vivaswan took birth. That's text 10. 11 and 12. O king, best of the bar to dine. See, from Vivaswan, by the womb of Sangya, Shadha Deva Manu. That's Vivasvata Manu, his son. Shradha Deva Manu was born. Now that's described in the sixth canto also. In fact, there's more detail. It's Puranic time. So Sangya was given in marriage to Vivaswan. When she came before Vivaswan to accept Vivaswan as her husband, he was so bright, you know, standing before the sun god, she squinted her eyes. It was difficult to bear seeing him. So he accepted her as wife, but he cursed her and saying, your, 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 your son 
will be the Lord of Death, Yamaraj. And she said something like, no, 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 there was no offense. It's just like, you're, you're so luminous. What to do? Please forgive me. Please make an arrangement so I, my only son will not be the Lord of Death. He said, all right, you'll have twins, Yama and Yami. And Yami is Yamuna. Those who take bath in Yamuna would not have to face Yamaraj, your other son. So there were twins, Yama and Yami, Yamaraj and Jamuna. Those are two of Sangya and Vivaswan. And then another is Vivaswatamanu or Shadha Deva Manu. So we're hearing from Canto 8 into Canto 9 about the question, the, the, the lineage from Vaivasvatamanu. So, Shraddha, Shraddha Deva Manu, having conquered his senses, begot ten sons in the womb of his wife. <clears throat> Shraddha. The names of these sons we read. <clears throat> it starts with Ikshvaku. <clears throat> and nine more. But before those ten sons were born, there were no sons. There was no children, period. <clears throat> and so, um, he approached, Vaivasata Manu approached Vishishta. Help. And so, he made an arrangement where Two demigods, Mitra and Varuna, were propitiated in a Vedic sacrifice. We mentioned Mitra and Varuna. Mitra and Varuna were sons of Kashyapa and Aditi. So they were approached by Vishishta to assist Manu <clears throat> in having children. So they were propitiated during a sacrifice, and while the sacrifice was going on or being prepared, the wife, Shraddha, <clears throat> paid her obeisances to the priest and mentioned to the priest, I'd like a daughter. So when he's offering oblations into the fire, the sankalpa, or the intention is there should be a daughter, and so sure enough, there was a daughter per the intention of the qualified Brahmana's sacrifice. And then, so the mention, that brings us to text 16. He was, on the one hand, satisfied or pleased that he had some children or a child, but his duty as a king and his desire as a king was to have a successor, to have sons or a son. So we hear that he approached Vishishta, please help. There was supposed to be a son. He spoke to his guru, Vishishta, as follows. Now, it's a, the next verse has a long purport. I'll just read the verse and let somebody else discuss the verse and purport tomorrow. My Lord, this is 16 ends, he approached Vashishta and spoke as follows. My Lord, all of you, this said Vashishta had a team of priests, all of you are expert in chanting the Vedic mantras. How then has the result been opposite of the one desired? This is a matter for lamentation. There should not have been such a reversal of the results of Vedic mantras. So it, we, we don't do those Vedic mantras like they used to, in part because people aren't qualified in this age of Kali. Plus, it's not the Yuga Dharma for this age of Kali anyways, for that reason and other reasons. Uh, we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and other Vedic mantras or Vaishnav mantras in particular rather than propitiating devas and 
trying to get this and that and the other thing. Going back to um, the sixth canto, actually it wasn't a mistake, it was just his wife, Shraddha, said something to the priest and the priest paid, his attention was going to what the wife said and not what Manu wanted. And so the result was as it was supposed to be, according to her intention, not according to his intention. Uh, rituals, Vedic rituals are, they're, um, there's all kinds of rules, all kinds of things that the age of Kali, even if there was a qualified priest, um, like there was in previous ages, there's all kinds of things that have to be just exactly right. And if it's not just exactly right, there's no effect or the opposite. Like the sixth canto example is Twashta. We heard Twashta was one of the sons of Kashyapa and Aditi, and Twashta was offended when his son Vishrupa was killed by Indra, and so he performed a Vedic yagya to get a to get a child, a son that would kill Indra. Indra having killed his son. He would, was the, the, the ritual or the sacrifice was for that purpose. But he made a little mistake. He would have made a one syllable mistake. And so he got an opposite result. Instead of saying Indra Chatroho, he said Indra Chatro. So instead of having a son that would kill Indra, he got a son that would be killed by Indra. One syllable. One syllable. So in, in discussing this, supposing there's Vedic rituals for becoming wealthy or something. So or you, you want a, a, a good husband for your daughter. You just get one syllable wrong. You get a bad husband for your daughter. Or you're, you have financial disaster. Just get one syllable wrong. Or any other thing. And, you know, anything that's not done precisely. I remember uh, the yagya that was performed for the installation of Krishna Balaram. Very wisely, Srila Prabhupada wanted the local Goswamis to take full responsibility for the installation of Krishna Balaram so that they couldn't complain later it wasn't done properly because they did it themselves. Very wise. He had them do it. And Padmanabha Goswami was uh, involved. And his, his father was also involved. They, like the head priest overseeing the whole thing. So I remember that the, the watching from the sideline, just even setting up the arena. I mean, it took half a day just to, like how high off the ground and which way is north and which color flag goes on the north side and then the south side, the east side, the west side. And, whew, you know, like any little detail that's not right. The paraphernalia has to be perfect. The mantras have to be perfect. If they make a mistake, they, the referee says you have to go back and do the mantras again because it has to be perfect. It was, it was interesting. And, you know, Brahmins don't always agree. That's an understatement. Commonly, Brahmanis will disagree. And they're doing yagya together. But, um, in the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Lord Chaitanya teaches, there's no niyamas. There's no hard and fast rules. Whereas with Vedic sacrifice, there's hard and fast rules. If you don't get it right, you don't get the result or you get the opposite result. If you don't match all the rules. Therefore, this purport for tomorrow's verse is going to describe the, the merit of Sankirtan, congregational chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. There's no rules. And it's to, it's to qualify us to receive yet another mantra, Gayatri mantras, where there are rules. And one has to be this and that and the other thing 
for, for the effectiveness, but it's to help qualify the unqualified in this age of Kali. It's a very merciful, most merciful um, benediction during this age of Kali to be able to approach Krishna, although unqualified, to become purified by that chanting. Hare Krishna. So for newer devotees, all this Puranic lore, probably confusing, but I hope you got the, the, the essence. I'll, you may find, to repeat, you may find some discrepancy over here it says this and over there it says that, what's going on. One possible answer is different yuga cycles describing, described over here and another one described over there. without making that differentiation within the text or the, or the purport. Any discussion? Uh, Jaram Paswami, if um, the, uh, <clears throat> you gave the example of a narration of Sukadev Goswami <clears throat> connecting two stories. So, um, I was um, just wanting to ask, um, you know, since you were emphasizing that different um, culpas explain a discrepancy, or what appears to be a discrepancy or something, some omission, um, <clears throat> then doesn't mean that Sukadev Goswami in um, speaking to Maharaj Parikshit um, is, his vision is extending all, across all the different kalpas or several kalpas in order to be able to uh, bridge those gaps in that way or connect things in that way. Subal, help me. Oh dear, sorry, Sukadev Goswami. Sorry. He has, he's got the big picture. And is that your question? He knows. In, and in some cases he expresses, in some cases, in most cases, anyway, in some cases he does, in some cases he doesn't express. This is this and that's that. He's just narrating. Because for, for his own reasons, but the, the essence is what he's presenting. Although detail is certainly very important. He's got the big picture. Is that your question? Yeah. Um, two, que two questions, Marj. You mentioned that the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is to qualify one for chanting Gayatri? In our tradition, in our ISKCON practice, yeah. We don't right away get... Hmm. We be, every, but everyone is eligible for chanting Hare Krishna. But our, our emphasis on self-realization comes from Maha Mantra or? Both, both. Why, did, why separate? Hmm. The, the uh, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is sufficient, is one answer for self-realization. If that's the case, why have Gayatri Mantra? Well, Hare Krishna mantra is sufficient because, in, in put in really simple language, the Gayatri mantras help us in the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. And the Hare Krishna mantra makes us eligible to properly chant the Gayatri mantras to give us the, the facility, the privilege of worshipping deity, which is part of the process. Bhagavat. Dharma is connected also with the Vipanchatrika system. So, the Vipanchatrika system has mantras. One assists the other and vice versa. And my other question in regards to Gayatri, you mentioned there are rules and regulation. Yes. 
I was just trying to understand when Prabhupada gave Gayatri Mantra how strict he was. Sometimes I've heard rules like, or I've read rather strict rules about chanting Gayatri that, you know, if one is sleeping during the Sandhya, then he should repeat it 1,000 yeah, times. He didn't, he didn't give us those strict rules. So, having not been given those strict rules, someone may follow, someone may not follow, and they're not um, punished if they don't follow. They're not given by our acharya to follow. Someone follows, that's nice. Someone doesn't follow, perhaps because they don't even know them, but not given by the guru, then by, by, it's not required. Nice. It's not essential. You want to add something? Thank you, Maharaj, for this well-researched and very technically correlated class. Uh, regarding the point of sometimes, some pastimes being respected by our tradition, despite they not being there in the original text, uh, I wonder what criteria can we use for discerning which are to be considered authorized and which what not. Idea? Say it again. What criteria can we use what criteria? Okay. for uh, discerning which we can consider authorized and which we can't? Because even the famous Raja pastime of uh, the gopis giving the dust of their feet to Krishna, you know, it so beautifully illustrates the mood of uh, mood of the gopi's selfless love but at the same time that is not found in any of our Gaudiya literatures or any scriptures so I'm not, I, 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 I got about 50% of your question I'm sorry okay so I, my hearing is bad Should I it's just like you had a hard time hearing yeah Krishna Arjuna I'm having a hard time hearing both of you okay sorry. diction is a little different so speak slowly and clearly okay. and consider me half deaf so <laughs> Sorry, Maharaj. I tend to speak fast. Okay. So, there are pastimes which past even our tradition has accepted, uh, but they're not found in the scripture. You they're give not a, found within the scriptures. In the original scriptures. But they're generally accepted. Yeah. You give, you give an example in the Ramayana. Yeah. There's also the famous example of the pastime of Narad Muni asking the dust of the feet of the gopis. Well, we, we, what the criterion, my understanding of criterion is, if given to us by, if verified by our acharyas, we accept. If not verified by our acharyas, we're cautious. Or just leave it out. When in doubt, leave it out. Okay. So, in Vrindavan, for example, there's all kinds of conventional stories. Hmm. And certain speakers, I won't mention names of certain speakers, they like, without discriminating, they just like to tell the stories that are conventional Vijvasi stories. And others are more discriminating. And they, so you're asking criterion. I'm on the conservative side. That which comes from our acharyas, just take for example, take for example the pearl pastime. That's from Raghunath Das Goswami. That's not yeah. in the Bhagavatam, but yeah. it's Raghunath Das Goswami. It's good. Hmm. It's as good as scripture. Yes, Maharaj. Especially with respect to the Ramayana, our tradition has not really commented much on it. So to parse which pastimes to accept, which to not, it becomes difficult with respect to Ramayana. Well, it, again, when your, your question specifically is what criterion do we use? I gave the example of yeah. Lord, yes. Lord Ram worshipping Lord Shiva, yeah, I agree. not in Valmiki Ramayana, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went there and okay. celebrated. That's good enough doesn't okay. give like a detail of what he yeah. said there and did there, but he went there and honored that pastime. Okay. Good enough. And otherwise, okay. you know, we can, we can say, you know, with you know, what criterion, this is not authenticated by our acharyas, but it's a common understanding that people say such and such. Okay. Like, you know, Here's, a, here's another for example. Um, I went with Shankadari from South India yeah. and a South India tour. We went to a number of places that I'd never been before, but he had been many, many times. 
And there are some narrations that are popular amongst the Sri Vaishnavas. I never heard them before. But they're accepted by the Sri Vaishnavas, so I just spoke and say with the qualification, this is an understanding of what took place in this location based upon the Sri Vaishnavas. Okay. And, and, and you know, with a qualified, it's not from our disciplic line, nor is it, to my knowledge, anywhere in scripture, like, you know, some songs by the Alvars mm. and their glorifications of, you know, the divyadashams and how, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. You know, the, the first of the Alvars and the, the deities came themselves because he was unable to travel, so they came themselves. Now he narrated that saying, this is an understanding amongst the Sri Vaishnavas. And he has a number of songs glorifying, and therefore, and the Sri Vaishnavas accept because they're direct glorifications of the deities that he didn't get to go to see, but they came to see him. Just qualify it like that. Okay, Maharaj. Nam Malvar and his wonderful glorifications of the forms of the deities that he never saw. Yes. The others are composed at the place by Alvars, that, etc. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a little, it's delicate. What, what we want to avoid is um, sounds nice, but there's no descending knowledge authenticity. So we, we want to be, I'm conservative in this regard. I want to be careful because otherwise it's a nice story that doesn't have that same spiritual potency and it opens the door for all kinds of other things. So descending knowledge, please. <laughs> And from our acharyas, like that, and other authentic lines of disciplic succession. That's the criterion that I use, anyway. In the Bhakti Rasamrita huh? Sindhu, there is also mention of Shastra Pramana and Loka Pramana. Yes. But there is no really very delimiting marker given for telling what all will come in Loka Pramana. So, well, you know, it, it's in simile, Shruti, Shruti, Shruti Smriti Puranadi, that okay. verse. So with making statements without reference, Utpataya Vakopate. Okay. It's a disturbance. So we don't want to make a disturbance. We're careful. Yes, Maharaj. And the Loka Praman, well, it's, it's like <clears throat> Krishna asking Nanda Maharaj, this yagya that you're doing, is it enjoying the Vedas or is it family tradition? Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean something's a family tradition, trash it. But you make a distinction between family tradition. There's value in family tradition, especially in Vedic times. But something must be done because it's enjoined in the Vedas and something should be done because it's family tradition. There's a difference. And today, there's like all kinds of family tradition the people do ritualistically without even knowing what it is or why it is and then they run into Krishna consciousness and say well wait a minute you know my family tradition was such and such so we have to be careful mm. in addressing people's family tradition thing and not just trash it it's not a zero but it, it has to stand you know below that's what's enjoined in the Vedas it's mm. delicate and it has a lot to do with the faith of the individual and so forth. It has to, it's, you know, it's very delicate for those who are presenters of, of truth, of, of, you know, Shastra Praman. You have to be very careful with faith of the individuals. Now, some persons, they don't care. They just get a nice baseball bat and slam. I don't, I, I, I don't think that's nice. Anyways, that's me. Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> very yes. beautiful answer. Thank you. Maharaj. Yeah. The question was such of you know answer because it's a little similar. But I, then uh, to the question of Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. But um, I was thinking on on the influence of uh, Tulsi Ramayan, even you know in 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 the text some of the texts that we use. Uh, that have been provided in ISKCON, you know, 
there's several books that explains about Lord Ram's pastimes. You, you've been studying it, and then we hear, we know Srila Prabhupada has said that, you know, you don't go there. Well, he said different things. There are certainly there are quotes that Prabhupada said, don't go there. And there's other quotes. I could, you know, recently viewed them because I've been preparing for visiting Ayodhya. And one of them, so, you know, you, you need the big picture, like this question Krishnarcha was asking. You need the big picture. And so Prabhupada was asked about Chelsea Ramayan, and he said, it's actually not Ramayan, it's Ramcharita Manas. And then he said, but it's the glorification of Lord Ram's pastimes, and therefore it is another Ramayana. And, you know, it was from the heart of a Ram Bhakta describing pastimes. So he didn't trash it or, didn't, or stay away from that. He didn't say that. Mm. And, you know, I don't know the circumstance. Maybe it was somebody whose faith was very strong in Tulsi Ramayana, and so he didn't smash it. I don't know the circumstance, but he didn't stay, stay away. Just made this distinction. It's not Valmiki Ramayana is Ramayana. And then included is Ramayana because it's glorification of Ram and we think the glorification of Ram is Ramayana. That's what Ramayana is. So... Yeah. Like for example, you know, when building the bridge, some versions say squirrel, some versions say spider. So, whether it's a squirrel or a spider, different versions, it's the principle. Thank you. And we make distinctions. When we, when we speak, there are different versions of Ramayana. Some say this, some say that. Here's the pastime. Yes. Hare Krishna. Uh, I was just, I think uh, my question is, I mean, I have a difficult time, I guess, due to my unsteady mind and like uncontrolled mind to retain the uncontrolled amount. mind. Yeah. Who's that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, you're like, not going to tell me who it is. Because <laughs> okay, uh, I find it difficult to retain the amount of information that I'm hearing that I desire to. So I'm just curious, how can I be more absorbed and kind of retain more and uh, just like remember more of what I'm hearing in Bhagavatam class? So you want to know how to get there? That's what your question is. It a question? Yeah. Or are you just like complaining? <laughs> no, no. How, how, how can I remember and absorb more? <laughs> <laughs> um, pick, uh, two things, simply. One is regular hearing. And then the second thing is through regular hearing purification and then um, in purification, then uh, better remembrance. One of, the, one of the characteristics of intelligence is good memory because intelligence guides the mind. But you know, both the mind and the intelligence are clouded by lust. So strong memory is assisted by brahmacharya. Strong memory is assisted by brahmacharya. So if you want to become stronger in remembering, then become stronger in intelligence and become stronger in brahmacharya. Thank you. And you know, we're, the background where we're coming from is not brahmacharya. The background where we're coming from, you know, our, us Western, you know, unfortunate souls, is not brahmacharya. And you know, and the world is becoming less and less and less. But when when that's there, then then sharp memory. And sharp memory is assisted by a keen intelligence. Then you can understand clearly this from that, and it sticks. Both strong intelligence and strong memory go well together. Sense control, mind control. Okay. Shila Prabhupada ki jai.